Good evening, viewers, and welcome to Calypso Showcase. And now to our special guest for tonight. He is the explainer. You knew him in the early years as the messenger. Winston Henry, a man with an enviable record. From 1977 to 1984, he made it to the finals of the Dimash Bra every year. I don't think there's another Calypsonian that can boast of that. Winston Henry, the explainer, welcome to Calypso Showcase. Yeah, happy to be here, Alvin. And what have you been doing for 1992 since Carnival? Well, since Carnival 1992, all I'm doing is trying to prepare myself for 1993 because I was a bit late this year with my recording. So I'm trying to get my thing together very early. So I'm here for a while. I'll be away for a couple of weeks in the next month or two. Where are you going to be traveling? I'm going to through the Caribbean and then I empty into New York. I'll be back in about two months' time. That is from next month, the 12th. Well, we want to take a look at your life tonight, your Calypso life, that is. And I know a lot of people might have forgotten some of those golden years of the, the explainer. Quite so. So we're going to take them down memory lane now as we look at the life and times in Calypso of Winston Henry, the explainer. Yeah, Winston Henry, the explainer. So good to uh, come down to your home here in Kokia Village and chat with you. Well, it's, I feel fine, Alvin, to see you reach here and you reach here very much on time. And you reach here with enthusiasm to make sure that this thing comes right. Okay. Well, I'm going to start at a place where you might not expect because my first recollection of you when I started to look at you work on a stage and I was impressed was you working at a penthouse. And I want to, to find out first of all if that's where your Calypso career started. Well, not really. My Calypso career went um, a little further back than that. But um, penthouse was a sort of budding ground for me. Um, Shorty used to sing there and they wanted a resident singer. So he told them it's better to take a young singer who could develop you know, and be able to work in the nightclub scene because there's very few sing club students who could really work nightclub. So then he asked me, why don't I come and take the job? And I, I, I took the job and I worked there for five years and I've learned a lot of things there, which assisted me in my career. Well, watching you work over the years because it's one of the places I used to frequent, I remember coming to the conclusion one night that this guy could actually become a Calypsonian because you were singing other people's Calypsos, you were doing a little extempo and a little, you know, bambo and those sort of things, but you always had a way you captivated an audience. I think this is one of the things that stood out about you. Tell us a little bit more about those years. Well, those years were the years you're coming up and you want to really be known, eh? So you're fighting and you're trying all different things. You know, I used to sing people's songs, um, hit calypsos, I mostly stuck to my calypsos. Well, due to the nightclub circuit, you had to learn a little yellow bird and all this kind of stuff, so I used to do that too. But I always stay with my, my authentic calypso, which I love very much because I love calypso since I've been in school. So let us talk then about your early, early careers and your early interface with calypso. What started it all? Well, uh, as you know, most Young guys in my days, uh, in uh, my age bracket, around 21 or 25 years ago, would tell you that they had emulated Sparrow. Because being a Trinidad and Calypso must be in your veins, and then catching on to Calypso, we, I emulated Sparrow. And I wanted to be a Calypso, and see them sing, I used to, my uncle used to come into the tents, and I see them perform and thing, and I figured being a Calypso was a good thing, and I feel that's my music. So I actually started hang out with Valentino. He has a lot to do with my coming into Calypso and the beginning of my career. Valentino is one of the guys. Uh, there are a couple more who I must make mention of, people like Brother Superior, um, Prowler, and even Relita. These guys were very, 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 very instrumental in my career. Well, I remember you singing at a Nafita Awards competition, like, uh, Verse of Life is a Stage, was it? Yeah, I did a, a part of Life is a Stage with Valentino. He asked me to come and sing a verse with him. And um, it's a song I used to do in the, in the Pentos also. I'd always loved that song. What was your first 
calypso that you actually sang in a calypso tent, and what year was that? It was 1970. Kitchener's Calypso Review. I sang The Thoughts of the Inventors. Could you remember any part of that at all? <laughs> well, it was basically like this, huh? It's, it's very difficult for the singer without instruments, but um, I could just roll a couple of lines. It was like this, better than a big brain or foolish man, but his thoughts were the cause of most inventions. Because sometimes I sit down and study things that men created in history. And no explainer will like to relate. Something like that. I can't even remember to go, but it was really basically the man who made the song he thought about singing. The man who made the dance, he thought about dancing. The man who made a book, he thought about reading. Now, we want to talk about the start of that era, 1977, and tell us the tunes that you sang in 1977 that took you all the way to the finals. Well, Alvin, it was... The, uh, that 1977, uh, it was... Once You're Black is my brother, man. And the partner to that was Charity Begins at Home, which took me all the way to the finals. But 78, I think, is when you really started to make your, the impact on the Trinidad public. A Calypso, We Smart. Now, this Calypso, I think, started to make people sit up and look at the Calypsoian explainer and say, hey, this guy has something to offer. Well, the, really, that was very, very popular, too. You think you're smart. And... But the, the, the tune that was really popular was A Message from My Show. Uh, it was a nice swing tune written by Merchant, and it had that pan beat and everything in it, and fatty spirit. It went down well on pan. Uh, it was not in the panorama, but it went down well on the streets of pan. That one was sort of what made, created the emergence in 1978. My Trinidadians daily Always does amaze me. They go from the bottom of the heart, telling the whole white world how we smart. This statement we just be making, I declare, is rather misleading. For the things that I see Trinidadians do, I would like to know if we smart for true. We hate calypsos and we hate pan, and that's we cultural weapon, and we smart. Yes, we smart. We want to change the government yet election time. Before we vote, we go on caranage to life. And we smart. You know what I mean? Yes, we smart. We discard in we own Trinidadian slang to preach Yankee and Jamaican. And we smart. I want to tell you. Yes, we smart. You earned the title of The Messenger, probably in 79. 79, I was, I was dubbed The Messenger because of um, them with dread and in Parliament it kicks in. Now, that record was very, very popular. At least four tracks and it was a hit because they had Sunday Night Fever on the same record. It's mass. Yes, it's Sunday night again. And Carnival Fever. Everybody pray is mass and excitement for so we go into parties want to see the match grass show masqueraders deep and beaters the revelers everybody types they are kind and the judges bearing grudges I say that they're doing it for spice the whole area and the whole Calypso atmosphere was taken up with Demo Dread, a sort of Calypso regal beat, which really had a, a created a certain amount of uniqueness in the Calypso arena. And I had a very beautiful season. No part of this country's constitution Tell you how to look and what to get We must treat the 
Rastas like they are human. Regardless to how they keep their hair. But while Swiss call the Rasta, Jim Jones killing people in Guyana. But what we must say instead is a plenty treasure. How much input did you have in the composition of those two tunes? Well, actually, they were my compositions. Uh, Demo Dread and In Parliament the Kicks In. Demo Dread and In Parliament the Kicks In were tunes that was composed in a matter of about hour time. No big set of thought because it was the swing and the beat were there and I was just playing around with the beat. And actually, they came in a short space of time. No very, very big thought. And they, uh, they went down very fine. In Parliament the Kicks In! in this country should treat these people more seriously when they have their parliament meeting something constructive should be happening i visit them one evening in the parliament detail for what has it happening like these people high up are poking why is the speaker speaking <laughs> every queen and newspaper reading <laughs> they want to stop old people from driving <laughs> <laughs> along, say joking they care but let's go to 1980, the following year. Well, the following year, I, I had a table turning, sir, round and round. And not me and the monarchy which was also popular, so they were both popular. Let's talk about the table turning, sir, because I think this was in the, the vein of your title of the messenger, because, you know, the political thing with a nice uh, melody behind it. Yeah, it was, a, it was international, or is an international topic that uh, look at all the various leaders throughout the world, the ones who we, we, we were made to know as tyrant-minded, what came, what came about their demise and all these type of things. And I was showing how... So many were falling that year. They had um, the Shaviran, they had um, Bokassa, and all these guys that were going down. So I was warning the local leaders that the table is turning around. So don't get caught up in it. The very world is going on. All who are start to fall back down. This might sound like fallacy. 79 proved this to me. I sure you remember. The fall of many world leaders, rulers of oppression, overthrown by the oppressed man. Table turning star, round and round, all and falling down. Table turning star, round and round, now the oppressor is the oppressed one, round and round, falling down, and they fall in down. Now, Not Me and the Monarchy, controversial tune. I think it was a reaction to the fact that you felt you should have done better the year before. With the tunes you had, you were doing well in the tent. And you came up with this tune, Not Me and the Monarchy, which also was, I think, something talking about the scouting for talent, the prize money. Tell us, tell, you tell us about the Not Me and the Monarchy. Some people misinterpret the whole basic of the song. But Not Me and the Monarchy, monarchy meant that I find that when a guy win the, the, the title of monarch, they used to give him something like two or three thousand dollars. But I find that was so small for a creative person and a cultural ambassador. And I would look at the scouting for talent winner. We get a, 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 a car value some kind of 40 something thousand, 50 something thousand. So I say, what is sense being a Calypso monarch and you can't even do something, get a, a price or reward where at least you could 
put a little tap, tapping on your, on, on your lifestyle or your, your domestic situation. And this was a little debate within the season until Sisson, Spain, speak it up. And they brought the Calypso Monarch Prize, the, the $24,000, which I find from 3000 to twenty four was a lot. And it was good. And I was in the Savannah that night. Every day people telling me, I throw away the monarchy, the wrong song. I choose to sing, that's how Stalin come to win. I said, don't be angry, that crown means nothing to me. That is a crown of thorns, it kills the Calypso. That is the problem. Why be a monarchy and live in a shanty? Not me, a monarchy, not me. You see, it's called with holiday. Value more than the monarchy. Not me, a monarchy, not me. I know the king of Calypso. She did like a Babisho. Oh, no. Yeah, well, this is why some people misunderstood. When you said, yes, me, a monarchy, they say, okay, he's selling out. Well, you see, the people who believe so never study the song, what I was saying. I was saying, if I have to go to put all that effort to win $3,000, not me and the monarchy, but it was $24,000 on the night, and I sang a whole verse in it. I said, now they raise the prize money. It's me and the monarchy. You might say I'm a waste because I'm still in the race. And I know what you're thinking, if I expect to win. Since I sing the monarchy, they raise up the prize money. Whosoever win tonight, is my song we make things right. So listen, here's the reason. I will trust nobody, neither Susie DC. Yes, me and the monarchy, yes, me. Since they raise the prize money, it's high court for CDC. Yes, me and the monarchy, yes, me. I know that was long ago, Calypso was party show. Oh, no, no more, no more, no more. Yes, me and the monarchy, yes, me. Yes, me and the monarchy, yes, me. All right, so the public said, where will Explainer go from not me and the monarchy? And let's talk about the year after that. Well, the year after that was Ras Mass. It's a high mass. I pictured the Rastafarians having their own carnival band and thing. And that is one of my greats, one of my classics, as people say, because your classics is the people make them. And it is dubbed one of my classics. Well, I want to endorse that it is one of your classics. And I think what is nice about it is that it's a fantasy type calypso, and yet it has an underlying message in it. And um, I think it caught the fancy of everyone. The music is good, and your way of putting it overall. Yeah, it related to the lifestyle of a people and a culture. And I was doing it in a, a vein with their type of music and their rhythm, and just expressing what they would do on or in a carnival band. So we come to 1992, the year of Lorraine. And if a man who went in the Savannah, that everyone would have placed the odds on as the odds on favorite, I think it was you that year with Lorraine. Yeah, I was the odds on, the beaten favorite. <laughs> yeah, Scranton beat me that night. Scranton kitchen, in fact. <laughs> and um, Lorraine, I thought I had won that year. It's the only 
time I, I, I believed to myself that I had one of the 90% chances of winning. I felt I had a pair of good songs that nobody else in the competition had. I had um, Lorraine, and if you're true, I'm gonna follow you. Mm -hmm. But somehow or the other, with that added punch from Kitchener, Shkanta pulled it off. And I really never argued it because it was a very, very popular night. already and if you start feeling lonely and mass fever vibrating your body just make a quick reservation and touch down in the land of steel band woman I don't cry I don't miss this jamming with all them steel band beating and woman back from shaking if they don't fight you baby then you must come and join me Inside the belly steel band Jamming with some mad woman Come and don't cry and leave in I can't miss this jamming With all the steel band beating And woman back up shaking If you don't fight your baby Then you must come and join me Inside the belly steel band Jamming with some mad woman All stars All stars All stars All stars Lorenzo Cryer, leave 